According to Wikipedia, typology in Christian theology and in biblical exegesis is a doctrine or theory concerning the relationship of the Old Testament to the New Testament. Typology is very useful for grasping truths about the Catholic faith because it is both at the same time simple and profound. Through typology, people, places, and events from the Old Testament are seen as a foreshadowing or a prefigurement of people, places, and events in the New Testament. Typology uses storytelling to deepen our understanding about the Catholic faith. And this is much like the approach that our Lord took to explaining truth, as he spoke in parables and in stories so that everyone could understand. Please listen prayerfully and open your hearts to see the typological prefigurements that lie waiting for us in the Old Testament. Before we examine how the Battle of Tours was prefigured in the Old Testament by David and Goliath, I would like to offer an idea. The Old Testament contains the entire history of the Israelites. The Israelites were the Old Testament people of God. Their entire history, from their inception until their ending, is completely contained in the books of the Old Testament. Similarly, the New Testament is the entire history of the new people of God, the Catholic Church. The New Testament really contains our entire history from start to finish. However, the difference is that for the Israelites, their history is entirely recorded in the Bible. Our history is still being lived out. We are still in the New Testament, even though our history is not entirely recorded in the Bible. With that concept in mind, it becomes clear why the Battle of Tours would be prefigured in the pages of the Old Testament. If the Old prefigures the New, then events in the history of the Church would be prefigured by the Old Testament. It's not just people, places, and events from the pages of the books of the New Testament, but it's the actual history of our church that comprises the actual New Testament. Now we are ready to look at how the Battle of Tours is prefigured in the Old Testament by the Battle of David and Goliath. Shortly after David was surprisedly and secretly anointed by the prophet Samuel, David's father Jesse sent him to King Saul with gifts. King Saul was very impressed with David and made him his armor bearer. Very soon after that, the Philistines, who were a warring people, threatened to attack the Israelites in the land of Judah. Goliath, a very large and powerful Philistine, called out for 40 days for someone to fight him. Neither side advanced towards the other, but both sides waited, ready for battle. From the first book of Samuel, chapter 16, verses 12, 13, 20, and 21. He, Samuel, sent therefore and brought him. Now he was ruddy and beautiful to behold, and of a comely face. And the Lord said, Arise and anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramatha. 
chapters 20 and 21. And Jesse took an ass laden with bread, and a bottle of wine, and a kid of the flock, and sent them by the hand of David his son to Saul. And David came to Saul and stood before him, and he loved him exceedingly and made him his armor-bearer. And from the first book of Samuel, chapter 17, verses 4, 10, and 16. And there went out a man base-born from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Geth, whose height was six cubits in a span. And the Philistines said, I have defiled the bands of Israel this day. Give me a man, and let me fight with me hand to hand. Now the Philistine came out morning and evening, and presented himself forty days. All the army, and even King Saul, was afraid to fight Goliath. Young David bravely stood up to Goliath and killed him with his sling. After Goliath falls, the Israelites pursue them and take over their encampment. Because of David's bravery and his victory, he is greatly esteemed by the people and eventually is made king of all Israel. While the line of King Saul is ended, King David's line of kings continues on to protect Israel all the way until its eventual end at the Babylonian exile. From the first book of Samuel, chapter 17, verses 11 50, 51, 52, and 53. And Saul and all the Israelites, hearing these words of the Philistines, were dismayed and greatly afraid. And David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone, and he struck and slew the Philistine. And as David has no sword in his hand, he ran and stood over the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath, and slew him, and cut off his head. And the Philistines, seeing that their champion was dead, fled away. And the men of Israel and Judah, rising up, shouted, and pursued after the Philistines, until they came to the valley, and to the gates of Acheron. And there fell many wounded of the Philistines, in the way of Sarium, and as far as Geth, and as far as Acheron. And the children of Israel, returning, after they had pursued the Philistines, fell upon their camp. And from the first book of Samuel, chapter 18, verses 7, 8, and 16. And the women sung as they played, and they said, Saul slew his thousands, and David his ten thousands. And Saul was exceedingly angry, and this word was displeasing in his eyes. And he said, They have given David ten thousands, and to me they have given but a thousand. What can he have more but the kingdom? But all Israel and Judah loved David, for he came in and went out before him. Now that we have the Old Testament stories in place, we can move on to the story of the Battle of Tours in the New Testament. The Battle of Tours took place outside of Tours, France, on October 10th, 732 AD, between the Catholic Frankish forces of Charles Martel and the Muslim forces from the Umayyad Caliphate, led by Abdul Rahman al Ghafiqi. This battle was an extremely pivotal battle for the future of Christendom in Europe. 
Historians throughout the centuries have agreed that if Charles Martel would have lost, it would have spelled disaster for Christendom in Europe. The Frankish kings of Europe at the time were the Merovingians, descendants of Merovic and Clovis. Charles Martel was the mayor of the palace for the Merovingian king, King Theoderic IV. During this time, the Merovingian kings had devolved into a do-nothing kind of king, and they didn't try to stop the Muslim conquests in Europe. Charles' victory is widely believed to have stopped the northward advance of the Mayad forces from the Iberian Peninsula, and to have preserved Christianity in Europe during a period when Muslim rule was overrunning the remains of the old Roman and Persian empires. Theoderic IV was the Merovingian king of the Franks from 721 until his death in 737. He was the son of King Dagobert III. His date of birth is not well known, but after 711 AD. During his reign, his realm was controlled by the mayor of the palace, Charles Martel. Had Charles Martel suffered at Tours Poitiers, the fate of King Roderick at the Rio Barbate, it is doubtful that a do-nothing sovereign of the Merovingian realm could have later succeeded where his talented major domus had failed. Indeed, as Charles was a progenitor of the Carolingian line of Frankish rulers and the grandfather of Charlemagne, one can even say with a degree of certainty that the subsequent history of the West would have proceeded along vastly different currents had Abdul al-Rahman been victorious at Tours Poitiers in 732 AD. The Muslim forces were far superior to Charles' forces. The Muslims had heavy cavalry, where Charles Martel didn't have any at all. Charles Martel won an amazing and very unlikely victory over the Muslim forces. At the onset of the battle, both forces faced each other and waited for the other to attack. This lasted for seven days before finally the Muslims charged Charles' army. Through a series of highly skilled maneuvers and tactics, the Muslim forces became disorientated. Their leader was killed and they went into a full-scale retreat. The Christian army overtook their camp and even captured their tents. It was under one of their ablest and most renowned commanders with a veteran army and with every apparent advantage of time, place, and circumstance, that the Arabs made their great effort at the conquest of Europe north of the Pyrenees. The Umayyads were waiting for the Franks to come out into the open, while the Franks, formed up in thick defensive formation, waited for them to charge uphill. It was a waiting game, and Charles won. The battle began on the seventh day, as Abdal Rahman did not want to wait any longer with winter approaching. Abdal Rahman trusted the tactical superiority of his cavalry and had them charge repeatedly. This time the faith the Umayyads had in their cavalry, armed with their lances and swords, which had brought them victory in previous battles, was not justified. Charles's hard-trained soldiery accomplished what was not thought possible at that time. Infantry withstood the Umayyad heavy cavalry. Both Western and Muslim histories agree that while trying to stop the retreat, Abdul Akhrahman became surrounded, which led to his death. 
and the Umayyad troops then withdrew altogether to their camp. All the host fled before the enemy, candidly wrote the Arabic source, and many died in the flight. The Franks resumed their phalanx and rested in place throughout the night, believing the battle would resume at dawn the following morning. The next day, when the Umayyad forces did not renew the battle, the Franks feared an ambush. Charles at first believed that the Umayyad forces were trying to lure him down the hill and into the open. This tactic he knew he had to resist at all costs. He had, in fact, disciplined his troops for years to under no circumstances break formation and come out into the open. Only after extensive reconnaissance of the Umayyad camp by Frankish soldiers, which by both historical accounts had been so hastily abandoned that even the tents remained, as the Umayyad forces headed back to Iberia with what loot remained they could, that they could carry, was it discovered that the Muslims had retreated during the night. And finally, with the amazing victory of Charles Martel and his turning the tide of Islamic invasion into Europe, we, he became extremely popular among the people. His popularity stayed with his house, the House of Carroll. Although Charles Martel never took the title of king, his grandson did. Charlemagne, the first Holy Roman Emperor and the great uniter of Christian Europe, was one of the first Carolingian kings. Charlemagne's empire would be the guardian of the church all the way until its ending when Napoleon deposed the last Holy Roman Empire, Francis II, on August 6, 1806. Although Charles never assumed the title of king, he divided Francia, like a king, between his sons Carloman and Pepin. The latter became the first of the Carolingians, the family of Charles Martel, to become king. Charles's grandson, Charlemagne, extended the Frankish realms to include much of the West and became the first emperor in the West since the fall of Rome. Therefore, on the basis of his achievements, Charles is seen as laying the groundwork for the Carolingian Empire. In summing up the man, Gibbon wrote that Charles was the hero of the age, or as Gurard describes him as being the champion of the cross against the crescent. After recounting the Old Testament story of David and Goliath and the story in the history of the Catholic Church, about the pivotal and astounding victory of Charles Martel against the invading Muslim forces, we are ready to see how the Old Testament prefigures the New Testament. In the Old Testament, King Saul was afraid to go up against Goliath. His people were counting on his leadership, but he didn't show any courage in the face of the great adversary, Goliath. It was the young boy, David, who would show valor and bravery. King Thuderic IV, much like his Merovingian king contemporaries, had no resolve or will to engage the invading Muslim forces that were making their way across Europe. It was the mayor of the palace, Charles Martel, who would show valor and bravery. King David was made the official armor bearer of King Saul. An armor bearer carried the king's shield and other weapons and protected the king in battle. Charles Martel was the mayor of the palace for King Thuderic IV. As such, the responsibility fell upon him to defend the kingdom, as the Merovingian kings of this period were largely inactive.
David won the battle against Goliath. His chances of winning seemed extremely small, but David credited his victory to the hand of God. His victory was a huge relief to the Israelites. Charles Martel won in battle against the vastly superior forces of Abdul Rahman al Kafiki. His victory seemed incredibly unlikely since no one thought an army without cavalry could withstand the cavalry charges of the Muslim forces. All of Christendom viewed Charles's victory as won by the hand of God, and it was a huge relief to Europe. Neither the Israelites nor the Philistines would make the first move and attack. Instead, Goliath called out to the Israelites to come and fight him, while the Israelite army and the Philistine army waited in battle formation. The Philistines were counting on Goliath's heavy spear and sword to win for them. Neither the Muslim forces nor the Christian forces would make the first move and attack the other. They waited in battle formation for seven days, until finally the Muslims advanced with their heavy cavalry charge. The Muslims were counting on the tried and true advantage of their cavalry to win the victory for them. Upon the death of Goliath, the Philistines turned and ran in full retreat. The Israelites chased them, killing many of them and overtaking their camp. Upon the death of Abdul Rahman al Kafiki, the Muslim forces went into a full retreat. The Christian army chased them and found that they had retreated so fast and so far that they left their camp completely set up and completely empty. David became extremely popular, popular with the Israelites for having displayed great valor and for having killed the giant Goliath and saving Israel from a Philistine invasion. He was later crowned king of Judah and then king of all of Israel. Charles Martel was regarded as the great hero of his age having saved Europe from almost certain Muslim invasion and subjugation. Charles Martel's grandson, Charlemagne, would later be crowned King of the Franks, King of the Lombards, and later the first Holy Roman Empire, ruler of all of Christian Europe. King David was the first great king of the Davidic dynasty, which ruled over Israel until finally the last Davidic king was deposed by Nebuchadnezzar. Charlemagne was the first Holy Roman Emperor. The Holy Roman Empire would rule over Europe and it guarded the church until the last Holy Roman Emperor, Francis II, was deposed by Napoleon. Napoleon. 